Hi, good afternoon, Eli. How are you doing today? Hi, Alvin. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. Stuck at home. You know, I I think t- it's today we're going to talk about the concept of the West, because I think it's very important to understand the idea of West, because it's central to the understanding of modernity, especially international politics. Often. These days we talk about non-Western IR, but in order to understand what is non-Western IR, I mean in the in the quotation mark non-Western, right? We need to understand what is the West. So why don't we just talk about this uh, the idea of the West today? What do you think, Eli? I think you have to be really careful when discussing the West because some people will say it's Europe and the United States or Europe and the United States and Canada and Australia or just the United States or just Europe. Uh, so I think it's a, it, 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 we have to be careful. Uh, but yes, I believe you are right to talk about what isn't the West. We need to start with what's the West. So what do you see as the West, Alvin? Is that like, have you, as you point out, the concept of the West is very problematic. We don't know, really, I mean, we need to really examine where does it start and where it ends, where we are the, the boundary. As, as you point out, it's very problematic. We need to be specific to begin with. I think my personal understanding is that there are multiple understandings of the West. The, the West can be conceptualized in multiple ways. We can actually discuss them one by one later on. How about you, Eli? How do you understand the West? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. Not just who it is, but what it is. Uh, I typically, you know, you can break it down and you're right into categories, perhaps uh, cultures or civilizations or even nation states. Uh, for me, I definitely feel like a lot of people would jump to the idea. It's like the Greco Roman British American culture is kind of like the West in sort of a, a metaphysical sense, perhaps. Um, I think that's a pretty good approximation for as far as I need. What do you think? I mean, it seems you mentioned about uh, Greek civilization. And of course, Greece is considered as the cradle of uh, the Western civilization. I mean, that's the conventional narrative. However, somehow Greece also fall into the Eastern Orthodox, so, which is a very complicated uh, case. So does is Greek culture the part of the East or is part of the West? I think when we talk about a specific case, all this problem, the multiplicities of meaning of the West come out. When when we get into, for example, when we talk about Turkey, or when we talk about Russia, and when we talk about Japan, do they belong to the East or the West? I think uh, we need to look into those concrete examples. That's a really good point. And I wonder if we can, if I could extend on this just a little bit and say, the the west or the east these concepts are just geographic representations of where the central power is coming from at any given time in history maybe like there's a timeliness to it what is the west actually depends on when is the west right and perhaps what we're talking about is what's this definition of modern maybe it's multiple modernities a little bit there too what do you think totally i think the the time plays an important role like which time period we are talking about the the temporality the temporal dimension. So when we look at the West, not only spatial West, right, the ge- geography, but we also look at the temporal dimension. For example, do you think the Frankish empire part, is part of the West or not? I mean, when you play the age of empire, you can play the Franks. Are, are they the part of the West or not? Yeah, so that's a tough question. And I don't know, really, personally, like I would say no. Uh, because, uh, you know, I feel like perhaps later in the nation state eras is where I really feel like we see the West today, perhaps, right? Maybe they were the West of then, but to me, that's pretty early on to be the West. I don't even think really personally, like a, a, a centrified, centralized Western identity existed before nation states, perhaps. Back, you know, when it was kingdoms that were all sort of uh, Roman Catholic or, you know, later the Protestant kingdoms, I don't necessarily there was, know that there was such a sense of unity of cultures in Europe at the time. I mean, there were so many wars. Uh, how could they consider themselves to be one thing if they were always fighting each other, I guess? What do you think? 
in the ancient world or in uh, in the medieval ages, perhaps the distinctions is not so much the West or the East, but it's more between civilization and uh, barbarian. For example, the Franks were considered from the Greek or Roman perspective as uh, barbaric. They were the barbarians, right? Not, not only the, the Frankish empire, but also many Germanic tribes. They were considered barbarians. And then the Greece and Roman, they were considered a civilization. Yeah, but what happened to the Celts, right? It, it also reminds me of the differences in governance styles because some of these were tribal governance, some of these were empires, some of them were uh, federal republics. So, you know, which one of those is the West? Uh, it, it's interesting because I would argue that some of Chinese culture today and throughout history has been more systematically tribal than federal or empire. And does that make it the West? I don't know, I, you know right? So, which, what, what, you know, what, what are we analyzing? You mentioned about the Celts. Can you tell us a little bit about the Celts? Like, what was, what were their system of governance? and how they organize. And first, let's begin with uh, the, the location. Let's say, where were the Celts located? Sure. So, you know, back in the Bronze Age, the Celts didn't really rule, but occupied much of Europe, the Central Europe, uh, you know, Lower Germany, the Swiss mountains, Northern Italy, France, uh, Spain, uh, uh, Romania, uh, even parts of Turkey. Uh, and they were bands, they were tribes, they, they, they didn't really have a centralized government so much as that they all agreed that they were all one central culture. And, but yeah, they were very much, you know, integrated in name only, right? And so that's how they were able to be picked apart and eventually pushed out of Europe for the most part. And, and the Celts of Ireland, some of them were there and then some of them showed up later. Um, you know, I'm not an Irish history expert or you know, but, uh, clearly their system of government today is not what they had before. But yeah, so they were a tribal system. And I think that, uh, you know, it goes to show that uh, when Vercingetorix was facing off against Caesar, uh, he was the last and probably perhaps only Celtic king, really, that united them all. They only united out of the face of utter destruction, and it still wasn't enough, right? And so perhaps that's a lesson to be learned about tribal systems. I don't know much about the tribal systems of uh, Native North America when, when the settlers showed up. That's outside of my realm of expertise. But I wonder, you know, it makes me wonder if other tribal systems have, you know, is that the cause of their downfall as well or something? I'm not sure. What do you think? Well, what you, what you mentioned, it's very interesting. Because you mentioned that the Celts uh, live on continental Europe, but for whatever reason, uh, I mean, people kind of when you say Celtic, they kind of associate with Ireland. So why this the this this connotations between uh, Celtic and Irish nowadays? Rather, I mean, people would not think think the uh, the Celtic people live on continental Europe. From what I understand, I've never been to France. Uh, I've been to other parts of Europe, but never France. But I understand that there are several statues and uh, you know dedications to ancient Celtic heroes. And somewhere I heard that Nicholas Sarkozy said, you know, the Celtic blood runs through his right. So like, I, I know that people in Europe are aware that there were Celts there at one time. I don't know why Americans aren't aware. Perhaps it's because like 25% of Amer the, the white Americans, 25% of them are, are, are Irish descent, right? So for us, Ireland is basically, you know, one of the major sources of call it, uh, of people who came to the United States. And, and you know, I think there's much fewer French or other types of Europeans that live in places that were once Celtic that moved to the United States. Yeah, when I study music in, in Canada, or when, when we were talking about Celtic music, we were thinking about Irish music, like traditional Irish music. That's the Celtic music for us. So that, I, don't, I don't know why. We, maybe another time we can dig deeper into this topic on the Celtic culture. Now let's talk about the concept of the West. Eli, what does the West mean in English language? I think language really determines how people think about the West. If not determined, but kind of inference how people think about the West. Perhaps to break it down simplest, I think life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness is really the Western ideal. Uh, and that's a modern convention. I think a lot of what we claim to be the West is actually modern inventions. We, you know, we often say it's Greco-Roman heritage or something, or Greco-Roman laws, or uh, Eudaimonia, or something like that. 
but really it's modern laws. We, there was this whole era where in you know the Renaissance and after the Renaissance and the industrial era and the age of enlightenment and the age of exploration where all these you know, international events were happening. They sort of bumbled their way forward into a system of international laws. And, and they weren't similar cultures for the most part. They were, you know, very diverse throughout Europe. So to me, the West is, it, it's liberalism, it's institutions. Okay, basically, uh, you have uh, the political definitions of the West, like democracy, uh, the rule of law, so when we talk about the West, we need to differentiate between the cultural West or the political West. For example, before we were talking about the Celtics and the Germanic tribes, I mean, culturally, are they part of the West? I mean, when we talk about uh, the political organization, do they represent the West? I think, as, as you mentioned, the, the concept of West is uh, the modern invention. And you, and you mentioned the, the pursuit of happiness and liberty, and that's more like an American ideal, isn't it? Right. So I definitely have a, a modern American, uh, you know, training. So for me, that is how, we, you know, it's just a simple like mnemonic tool for us to break it down, right? It's, it's, it's a, what do you call that? You know, an advertising bullet, right? It, it's the, the listicle generation you know, we want to put the West into as simple a paradigm as possible, or as simple as, you know, try and square it in. And yeah, for me, what we've been talking about this whole time, it's so hard to do that. But the modern perception, I think, from the United States would be life, liberty, happiness. I think you could ask anybody, you know, what do you expect out of your government, your society relationships? What do you expect your, the ideology of your neighbor to be? In the United States, you're going to often hear life, liberty, happiness. Life, liberty, and happiness. This three criteria in, in a nutshell represents more the American interpretations of modernity. But how about you, you live in a Western country that has monarchy, for example, that, it, it, uh, that is not a republic. Then perhaps we, we can talk about this concept of multiple modernities. Uh, are you familiar with the, the concept of uh, multiple modernities by Eisenstadt? Uh, yeah, I think I've read some work by uh, a few authors on that. I think it was uh, what, Lily Ling, HML Ling. Yeah, and, and basically his, uh, the central argument is that even within Europe, within the so-called West, different countries have taken different developmental paths towards modernities. So, so there's not a single form of modernity, but rather mo modernities. Bring it back to the contemporary world. We can already see in politics, for example, uh, the politics of non-binary in the United States. I don't know if you read a recent uh, article on the New York Times, uh, they say that uh, French think that the kind of non-binary kind of discourse is an attack on their Republican values in, in France. Have you seen that article? Sure, yeah. And, and then we can see there's tensions between, let's say the French universalism versus the Anglo pluralism, this kind of tension. So which one is the West? <laughs> I don't know. I really don't. And I don't know if I could possibly objectively know because I'm so steeped in American culture and heritage, right? It would, I don't even think, this is one of the major problems you and I have talked about. I have problems with political science as a whole and the philosophy of science as a whole. How could it not be cultural? It, of course it's reflexive, of course it's critical, but I am, it's like a Steve bag team. It, 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 I'm so American, how can I delete that? I, when I moved abroad, you know, I've lived and worked abroad several times and you want to fit in as much as you can, but it's ultimately a futile task and you're going to wear yourself out because you can't, you know, erase your metaphysical layer. It's too hard. I can't, I, I don't know which one of those is more of the West. Uh, how about uh, Latin America? There's a lot of people in Latin America whose ancestors came from Europe. Are, you know, do we consider Latin America to be the West? That's a very good question. Yeah. Some scholars think that uh, Latin America is part of the Western culture because it's uh, Spanish and also Portuguese heritages. Uh, 
However, some other scholars dispute that. They also think that the indigenous culture have enriched uh, Latin American culture. And, and some scholars even think that it's the third world of the West. So it depends on who you ask. It, it, Latin America is a very tricky case. I, I don't know much about it. Maybe we can ask someone from Latin America to talk about it. Do they feel they belong to the Western culture? I mean, when I live in Europe, I met people from Latin America. Sometimes they, they feel they're very different from uh, the Spanish and also Portuguese. Sometimes they feel they're similar. So it's always this back and forth. And they're also part of the new world as, uh, as opposed to the old world. Why don't you uh, talk a little bit about these distinctions uh, between the new world and the old world? Yeah, so it's, that's something we definitely refer to in the United States, and perhaps it's just being on the other side of that, once being a colony, that colony mentality. Uh, you know, clearly none of us alive today in the United States were colonized, we're, we're, we're here to colonize America. I mean, everybody came here from somewhere, right? So we kind of consider the previous place to be the old world. And I think that's, there's, I think there's a new word for it, like third culture kids. I think in some ways, all of us in the modern world are third culture kids, right? And and I think that's just something that was baked into the American identity for a long time is that this was the new and Europe was the old. But clearly, I mean, America today doesn't resemble America from 100 years ago at all. And it won't in 50 years resemble what it resembles today. So how, or how can we even, how is the West still the West? Right, and, and so let's try zooming in on one country in particular though. Let's talk about Turkey. Is Turkey the West? That's a very good question. Turkey, I mean, in a certain period of time, uh, some thinkers try to uh, westernize. I think this, this westernization movement, however, um, in, in recent years, they kind of try to get back to the, the past. So it's always like a back and forth, like a pendulum swing between uh, westernization and then Islamization and back and forth. So Turkey is an extremely interesting case. It's situated uh, in between the West and the East. Sometimes uh, they don't identify as the West or the East. I think that it's very similar to Russia also. R Russia is also, uh, uh, for example, during the time of the Peter the Great, he, he tried to westernize Russia, but then you have uh, the Slavify who wanted the, the, the traditional Russian culture as anti the, the Western world because they see the West as materialistic. Whereas the, the East, right? I mean, the East, uh, on, I mean, when Russia say the East, it's not the Chinese East. It, it, we have to make that distinction. They think the Slavic East is more the spiritual, the more wholesome culture, more, more based on community, as opposed to the individual and collect, uh, as, as to the materialistic West. Yeah, it's you, tough. I think there's a lot of places that are, you know, and this is why I feel like that the entire idea of the core and the periphery becomes overused. It's because there are some places where it's been stable borders and stable cultures for a long time. And there's other places where they've been turbulent. And it's the places that are stable that are often seen as cores. And, and you know, how is that just economic? How often is that not just economic history of the, the luxury of stability versus the, the, the penalty for, for chaos. And, and so suddenly you get lumped into this always changing areas. And, and it, you know, I think there's a, a developmental cost there. Sometimes there's an opportunity, but I think there's often a developmental cost, at least a cultural cost when you're having, you know, a clash, a literal clash of cultures, you know, there, there's nothing's for free, right? Uh, what about Japan? Japan is a place that's it's got toes in both both sides. It is the West and, you know, it's also sort of the East if, if there was such a thing. Yeah, it, it depends who you ask. And that's why I think that it's very important to see how uh, the, the so-called known West see the West. Often when we talk about uh, the concept of the West, we look, we're looking at how people uh, in the West see the West rather than how the known Western, the so-called known Western, I put it in a quotation mark, the known Western people or the, the rest see the West. I think that it actually shape the idea of the West. I think it's very important that we go beyond Europe and North America to see people outside uh, Western Europe and North America to see how they see the West, how they construct the idea of West. In, in fact, the idea of West, it's crucial to their modernity. 
you asked about Japan in the during the Minji restoration. I, I don't know if you heard of the leaving Asia theory. Basically, during the Minji, Japanese uh, intellectuals they want to leave the confusion Asia. They think that's backwards. Japan needs to change. If Japan doesn't not adopt to the Western civilization, it, it will eventually be wiped out from the planet. So there was this urgency to, that's why they say leaving the Asia and joining Europe. That was during the late 19th century. And, and nowadays, <laughs> and in the, especially in North America, people talk about Japan as like Asian, <laughs> right? It's like very bizarre. I mean, if you, you really understand the theory of leaving Asia, so in fact, Japan, I mean, I should not use the word Japan, let's say Japanese intellectuals. I think it's better when we talk about this issue, we, we should specify the individual. And for example, uh, Fukuzawa Yukichi, I mean, let's say he, he, want, he want, wanted Japan to leave Asia and join Europe. In 21st century, when we talk about Japan, we think they're Asian. So I think this, this cognitive gap in between our perception and how Japanese intellectuals see themselves. What do you think? I think you're right. And I, and I love how you brought up how that's a mirror for how we see ourselves. Some of, I think, the best animes, uh, Japanese animes, are, you know, heavily Western culture. And they, as a child, I watched them, right? And so I'm getting my definition of Western culture reflected at me from Japan. I think that's really interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, so now that we're on the idea of the non-West and, uh, you know, the East, my question for you is, uh, how are this, this concept of what is the West evolving and how is the East evolving? I want to talk about this in geopolitics now. <laughs> which side's going to win? Uh, which side offers the best ideas? Are these ideas, these concepts of civilizations, are they evolving in response to this new competition sort of environment that we have today? I think, again, this is really, we need to go back to our original question. What is the West? What, what does it really mean? When you say uh, geopolitic, whether the West will win or the East will win, I don't really know. So what is the East? What, what are the values they embody, right? When, when we talk about the West, you mentioned about institutions. Do we mean democracy? If we mean democracy, we need to ask what kind of democracy? Let's focus on the political institutions as an example for now, because it's more concrete. Let's say, when we talk about democracy, do we mean American democracy, two party system, bipartisan, or do we mean the more uh, German uh, democracy where you have multiple party, uh, you have coalition. Basically, there's no a single party that can be the ruling party. It's always negotiations among different parties. Eventually they make a coalition and then they form the ruling party. Or do we talk about the more Westminster, the parliamentary system, like in the UK and in Canada? And or, or do we talk about the French democracy or Japanese democracy? I love Australia's uh, ranked choice voting. I think that's a genius idea to add to, you know, any sort of democracy system. But what about China's democracy? They have village elections. There are so many great Chinese political scientists who look at that and how, you know, the county level elections in China are actually a brilliant uh, democracy. If only they could elevate that to higher levels of office, if we could elect governors, if we could elect, right, if that actually worked. So, yeah which institutions matter? You're right, I think rule of law is a very strong Western institution. Uh, rule by law, you might say, is another type of institution. So, right, China, the East, we were talking about other systems, perhaps we could say, might have other institutions. We can't just say it is institutions. It is specific institutions. Human rights, there are different definitions for that. So it's specific institutions that create the West or differentiate it from somewhere else. What do you think? Yeah, when you mention about law, and then it, do, when we say the when we say the Western world, right? Do we mean international law, or do we mean the EU law, or do we mean American uh, constitution? What exactly? We have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada, so we don't have the constitution. When we talk about yeah law, what do we really mean? Right? Western, and it, it, when we talk about specificity, for example, in United States in Canada, we use the common law, but how about civil law, 
in continental Europe, also in Quebec, in French Canada. At least I can see at least two versions of competing uh, versions of the West. I mean, in terms of law, like uh, civil and common. And then in fact, Japan used the continental, the civil law and also, so is China. So is China the legal system Western or is Chinese? Uh, the reason I bring up this is that we can see so many uh, tensions among these different concepts. So to search for a pure West, maybe it, it just does not exist, the, the, the so-called pure West. Maybe the West is just a fusion. In fact, maybe there's multiple Wests. Fact, I guess my question comes then is, you know, Xi Jinping has stated that one of his goals is to create a buffet of options of governance for the world. So if that's the case, will the West be overtaken by the, the globe, by the total, by the whole, by the world? And, and I really feel like, you know, when you hear the types of investments going on, when you hear the types of, uh, you know, the competition between Build Back Better World or BRI, when you hear these sort of you know, plans to develop the global South, as it were, to compete for it, uh, you know, it makes me wonder, will there truly emerge a buffet governance style? Will the UN grow in power around the world? And if not the UN, then what? And that, that, that was kind of the question I wanted to get to earlier is, you know, this competition, uh, John Mearsheimer often says there's no ideas behind it. The Chinese don't offer any ideas. And my, my I guess my question back is, he, you know, can the liberal order survive beyond the United States? There's so many other options already present. It just makes me wonder, you know, this competition, it's more serious, I think, than people give it credit for, right? This uh, strategic culture and soft power. I think that's a lot happening on a grander scale than people really question. And I wonder, will this idea of the West just disappear completely to the, the new global reality? What do you think about that? Globalization? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a very interesting, this question. And when we talk about the West, do we mean globalization? I mean, for many people who growing up in the 80s or the 90s, they think the globalization is interchangeable with the West. So we are all becoming the same. We are all global citizen. So there's no West in the East. But if we are all global citizens, which citizen are we, which globe are we citizens of? Are we citizens of a mostly West globe or a mostly East globe? You know, it, what is the exact makeup of the, the slices of this global culture? And it, my question is, I, I guess what I'm really getting at is how it's changing and how it's relational and, and the power is relational, the global culture is relational and it's proportional. Right, uh, the United States push has, has brought English to the world. It's probably the one thing we've done that's really, you know, helped to provide a a, a playing field for you know future development of ideas in the internet. Right, things like that. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be the primary thread of culture. It's not going to be the closest to heaven. It's not going to be the center of the universe forever. So where is this pole moving, right? It, it's clearly not, not no longer a unipolar world. I think everybody recognizes that. But that also means a unipolar world of ideas and cultures. And where is this, you know, the north is moving on the compass. Where is it going? And that's what I want to find out. And who's pulling it really is, you know, who has the best power to pull north? That's interesting to me. And that's why I think the idea of the West is just not going to survive. I mean, when, when you talk about the, uh, the West, do you mean the classical West? That as how we understand it? Like, you know, the, the West of the Greco-Roman civilization or, or the world of Shakespeare, the Anglo West? Yeah. I think all of that will eventually just be another minor blip on the tapestry of humanity. You know, the British Empire used to be huge, and I'm not saying they don't have any influence or power now, but it's greatly diminished from what it was. And we have to understand that that's possible for the United States as well, you know, in a, in a global society, in a global, fully globalized earth where all trade is equal, then, you know, our society is not the largest driver of everything. And, you know, demographics are going to continue to make that the case. You look out at demographics 50 years from now, and the population of Africa is going to be huge, even if their GDP doesn't go up, which it likely will per person, right? Uh, 
the United States will be diminished. And it, it's, I, as some people say, you know, it's not a finite world. That's fine. Whatever. I, I'm not trying to say it is a finite world. I'm just saying that there are other, you know, rising stars out there and relative or not, the dynamics are changing. The relations are changing. Close is more important than big sometimes, right? And, and I was just reading about in East African Union, uh, you know, countries are going to merge into one. These kind of things can change the, you know, the international dynamics, I think. And a lot of people aren't, Maybe I'm just a structuralist. I don't know, but it's there, right? It's there. And so I think to get to your question, the West is not going to be as relevant, any definition of it in the future as it is now or was in the past. I mean, it, it depends, right? Do you see it as a spatial kind of category? I mean, it can move the, the, the concept of West. It can move to different regions and places. It can move to different countries. But then when we talk about values, is something intangible. Right, for example, when you say globalization, equality, right, I mean, is that Western or is the more uh, universal human aspiration? So we, we need to look at that. I think right? it's universal. Yeah, look at the, what was the Prince of uh, Wales just a couple, what last year, the World Economic Forum was talking about the Great Reset. The Great Reset, how many people are on board with that? A lot. How many people in the United Nations or in the Vatican or I, I think you I think you do see a general, I'm not a universalist, but I do think that there are some things that just the vast majority of people do agree on. And I think certain things like human rights, you know, there may be two camps, but one is much larger than the other, right? So yeah, you're right. The definitions of what are the West, we need to define those. And I think we can. And I think it's not something that we're imposing. I do think that's, you know, majority rule. Yeah, and then you know we can also look at democracy, right? Is that a, a universal human aspiration? And then we can look at different forms of democracy. For example, the conventional narrative is that democracy is a product of the West. I mean, in particular of the English. I mean, trace all the way back to the Magna Carta. I mean, that's just one of the narrative. And then you have a different narrative uh, of like the French Revolution. <laughs> Then you have the American yeah. narrative. <laughs> I mean, it depends who you ask. Yeah, even in uh, you know, ancient China, <laughs> in the Zhou Dynasty, they knew the kings knew that democracy mattered because I, there's there's I, I don't have the exact quote off the top of my head, but it, it's from one of my essays I, I wrote about the Duke of Zhou. But there there was a saying that said, you can't control the land, you have to control the people because the people can just leave the land and then you're just left with land and that's nothing, right? So that's democracy. They knew that the people matter just as much as the resources or the power. You know, This is something that's been in, I think, Chinese governance a lot longer than it's been in the West is differentiation between authority and legitimacy. In, in the United States, they're the same thing, but in China, they, you know, one comes from the people and other comes from the law. And that's a differentiation, I think, that does matter. And so, yeah, what at some level, is this something that we can learn in the United States or in other countries? Are we willing, are our people willing to adjust our ideas of governance to include new ideas? I don't know. I, I, what do you think about that? In fact, like in the NLA, in the Confucians NLA, they talk about the, the importance of the people, right? They use the analogy as the people like the water. You can hold the bow, but they can also flip the bow. And going back to democracy, and even going back to Greece, when we look at political theory, I mean, when you think about democracy, they have the uh, Aristotle's, the typologies of uh, uh, monarchy, oligarchy, and democracy. And the six types, right? Democracy actually is not the, it's the least favorable. Sorry, it's not the least favorable, but it's not the favorable uh, archetype, but it's more the monarchy. I mean, when you look at the classical Western political theory, Aristotle, he actually thinks that monarchy, or the same with Plato, monarchy is the, the, the best rule of the, the best form of government. And is that the West? When we talk about the West, we, we, we don't only see democracy. We also see, let's say, say during the Second World War, and we, can, we see Nazism and fascism. They're also part of the, the Western history. And do we do so? Do we really cherry picking the liberal West as the the West, or do we include different uh, the di you know the various West? For example, I think to answer that, uh, no, go ahead. For example, take Germany as an example. 
Germany wasn't even considered as the West until after the World War II. You can argue that. So it's Germany, I mean, even like in the early 19th century, the idea of Germany, right? Uh, I mean, the, sorry, the state. I mean, Germany did not even exist. It was different principalities. And at that time, they, no one would consider them as the West. That would be like the UK uh, and France, the Western Europe. I mean, Germany was considered like backwards. And then therefore they have this concept of the middle Europa, the, the middle Europe, right? The, the, the culture sphere of the middle Europe. So do they belong to the West? I think that there's so many variants of the West. We, if the most narrow, the narrowest definition, it could be like the English West, the Magna Carta, right? The Industrial Revolution. It's just like in a tiny piece, not even Scotland. It's just a tiny piece, the England, where the, for example, Manchester, London, the South and England, th this part uh, are the, the West. I mean, in the narrowest definition. Then you, you can expand to the whole world, the largest the, in the entire group, the globalization, capitalism. What do you think? Yeah, I definitely think that's a fair take. I think you can find, I think some people don't even realize that too, is what's interesting is that, you know, some people may not realize there's such a, a broad spectrum of what the West could be. But as someone who, you know, is an area expert on China, it's completely obvious as soon as you see it. It's for since 1900, the, like the most famous question since Jonathan Spence is, who is China, right? Uh, so I think as somebody who you know studies China a lot, uh, we already know that China is not China. Modern China is not old China, and there never was a China. There was all these different things at all these different periods in history. And so when we talk about it, and we talk about it so abstractly as one monolithic universal thing, I, I, just like we do with the West, I think it, it's pretty, um, it, it, it's unfortunate, but it's also just like one of those common things that happens with a stroke of a pen and you forget and don't even realize you're doing it. And so, yeah, I think it's very uh, sage of you to point out the the, the prism of the West. Uh, yeah, and th I think that also is part of the problem with the West going forward is if the West was to survive and continue to be a thing that is needed in the consciousness of people, then it's gonna have to, uh, you know, centralize its uh, message perhaps because you can't have a, a raucous, uh, conversation or Congress of ideas and have it also be stable, right? I think that's one of the big, and this is something we talked about last week with war games. One of the most important things you learn from a war game is if you have authority and stability, it's easier to get things done. And there's longevity in that. This is the same thing with refreshing our uh, institutions. If we don't have a harmony of people trying to refresh and rebuild our institutions, they will degenerate, right? And we've seen this this year in the United States uh, on a certain day. Right. And so, uh, yeah, going forward with the West, we're going to have to decide what those institutions are. I mean, if we want to do that, we don't have to clearly. Um, but if we do want to, you know, make the West be a thing, if people want that, perhaps not me, but people, then, yeah, you, you're you going to have to have some level of remaking the institutions. There was a book a couple of years, maybe last year, Superpower Interrupted. But yeah, it, it, the whole point was the Qing dynasty eroded because its institutions eroded, not because of economic decline. It was institutions. And perhaps there's a lot of natural disasters that didn't help. You know, hundreds of billions died in floods, but the institutions. And so, yeah, if we want the West to be a, you know, a democracy or human rights, each one of those is an institution that needs to be refreshed if we want it to be that way. So my question to you then is like, what is the West? What are we working on? If we're repainting the house, what color are we painting it? And which part of the house gets repainted first? Uh, you know, human rights or international law or democracy, which one are we actually working on to promulgate as the future of the West? Yeah, that's a very good question. Maybe all of them. And, and then we should add even newer things, for example, in, environment. Let's talk about the relationship between language and the Western culture. Think about this throughout history many West, the so-called Western, in a quotation mark, the Western intellectuals, they share, maybe it's the language that they share, the educated one, they could speak Greek and Latin. They, they couldn't, they know the ancient world, maybe because there's, they know the ancient civilization, this kind of heritage bind them together. Even though they could have different nationalities, yet they still share this Western culture. Do you think that that's 
that could be the explanation. They, they share the same classic, the so-called Western canon. Whereas nowadays, many people, they no longer read the same Western canon. And they, they no longer have this share of classical knowledge about the ancient, ancient world, the ancient Greece and Roman. Yeah, I think that's a good question. It's a valid question. Um, yeah, you're right. For uh, What you're saying is we're equating the metaphysical to one that's shared over time. And I think you're right that the people who could read books, they had one sort of lens through which they were seeing the world and they were taught the traditional and conservative value of maintaining that one lens through which they see the world. You're right. I think they were kind of the torch bearers of what it was to be educated in Western for their era. And they did progress that torch through history. I completely agree with that. And I also agree with you now that it seems like instead of torch bearers of Western culture, Western civilization or Westism, we now have a bunch of people holding tiny little sticks of fire, right? It's a lot more diverse of a room. So yeah, that does account for uh, it, it, specifically linguistically. To get to your point, linguistically, you know, individual cultures within the West, yeah, I think that definitely changes how we determine the West. You're right, Slavic West probably is different than French West, and that may be a culture issue. It may be a factor of history. It may be a factor of language. It may be a factor. It's probably a factor of all the three of those things, right? When I was doing historical linguistics, where did Mandarin come from, right? It did not come from within, right? You know, language has history, and history has language. All of those have culture, and all of those have identity, and I don't think you can separate them out. And I, I don't know if you could put all of the causation on one of them. I'm not a big fan of causation. I'm a big fan of process. And I think a lot of that is process. It's a process of becoming, a process of identity, and, and it's a process of real politic, right? I mean, people had to take Latin courses uh, in the past in Canada. It's, they no longer need to take Latin. I, I think nowadays it's very few people would take Latin. I don't know if they still offer that. I mean, even in Ontario, some you know, high schools, they no longer offer Shakespeare. I don't know about uh, in the United States, but in Canada, I think in grade 10, grade 11, uh, we, have, we had to take Shakespeare, like Macbeth, King Lear's, I don't know. In the United States, did you have to take uh, Shakespeare? Yeah, for sure I did. It was a long time ago. I remember we did plays. Like I did the Canterbury Tales as a play in middle school, right? We, we did those things, but I, I don't know if they do them now. It's been a long time since I've been in school. But even if you do, I'm not sure that I remember anything from it, right? It may, we, you know, the, a lot of this, we talk about old wives tales or remedies, right? Uh, this kind of like what we assume is common knowledge and baked into our culture. A lot of people have forgotten a lot of that stuff, so maybe it's not. Maybe it's not baked into our culture. Maybe I, I don't know anything about Shakespeare. I mean, I read it a long time ago. I didn't care. I was more interested in other things, right? So what values people might assume I have for being an American that derive from Shakespeare, I don't have whatever they are. Uh, maybe it's a don't be a fool because I never learned. I haven't learned that enough times <laughs> in life, apparently. <laughs> to be or not to be. Yeah, in Ontario, nowadays, in some school, even grade 10 and grade uh, 11, they no longer need to take Shakespeare. And just imagine this young people, when they grow up, I think they, they, might, they no longer share the same visions of the West as the older generations. Maybe it will, I think education will create the so-called generation gap. In fact, when, when you, what you think about the West, maybe the young people do not think the West is, and it's the same, like how we think about what is the West, Maybe the, the senior, they don't think that's the West. The West they used to, to know, it's very different. I think that the, for example, the baby boomers, when they think about the West, maybe it's as opposed to the, the communist East, right? The Iron Curtain. <laughs> maybe that's what's the, the West and that's what was the East, Iron Curtain, I mean, separated by the Iron Curtain. But when, nowadays, when we think about the West, what, what do we mean? Do we mean capitalist, consumerism? Do we mean globalization? Do we mean multiculturalism? And going back to the uh, language, do you think that English language has become the symbol of the West as the lingo franca? Or is English has become a more the global language? It's neither East nor West. 
I think I'm more of the global language kind of thing. And I think you're right that, you know, I think this language bit also pertains to what you were just saying about education. If the the idea of the West or, you know, multiple modernities, multiple Wests, if your goal is to join the, whatever that is, education can be a big part of it, right? Uh, you know, in, in cultural anthropology, you have uh, uh, cultures that decide to join other cultures or they don't. You know, when people move, if you're, if you're from another culture and you move into a place, you either join it or you resist, or, you know, you, it may be a little of both, but there are some who fervently resist, right? And there are others who fervently adopt. This sort of educational planning or strategic culture to some degree, you know, can definitely change what the definition of the West or anything is, right? And you're right to say that millennials have different views of the West than boomers. I know I definitely do. And I, I thought it was hilarious that you mentioned the Soviet East. I think that's exactly what I would say. My parents' view is the East versus the West. And you're right. I probably think of something completely different than uh, you know Gen Z does. Uh, but I, to go back to your education point, I think education, go, you know, look at the, the, the birth of nationhood in, in Germany and in Western Europe towards like the 19th century, you have this school starting to spread. They weren't, you know, for thousands of years in Europe, in the Middle East, you had to pay to be educated, right? It was never a, a civil right or, you know, a, a service provided by the government. And over the last 200 years, it's spread around the world. Is that the West? And also, does that create the West? And also, will it create the future of the West? I think that's something that we definitely need to be aware of. And I think a lot of people in education are. But outside of education, I don't think anybody pays attention to that. And I think we probably should, which is another reason why I argue that IR shouldn't be part of political science. It should definitely be a social science. And uh, you know, culture and education and, you know, we, it's broad, right? It's, it's at the nexus of a lot of things. And when we talk about even the West, if we're just using political science, I don't think we're going to cover it. And talking about global English, as more and more people from around the world start to use the English as their working language, in fact, through this process, it has transformed the English language. So now here's the thing. I have been living in many countries and I noticed that how English is used in different countries vary. For example, in North America, we have so many slangs. And, and do, do those like slang represent the global English or it's more like a local and provincial? And whereas the when you talk about the global English, right? And and then when they talk, the global English speak to the more like a North American English, sometimes they don't even get each other. But for example, in North America, people say, hey, hey howdy. <laughs> like this kind of thing, you know? I think that people who speak global English, they will not understand that. I mean, living almost a decade outside North America. I, in fact, like when I hear this slang, it sounds very bizarre. I think that was like from my youth. I, I remember those kind of thing. But then, even now, I don't know why it is funny when I hear people say that, like, howdy, yo. <laughs> it, it's that the, the West or it's not the West, right? And then it creates the misunderstanding. And which English is, is the West? It's the North American version or it's the more global? Uh, English where everyone kind of participate in and kind of use, develop new words and new phrases. Yeah, so I have a background in linguistics, so I definitely say that global English is the future. We know that uh, dialects are dying out faster than ever before because people want standardization in language. And, and there's economic reasons. I have friends who are Native Americans who are, you know, sad that their parents made them learn English. And I have other friends who are Native Americans that say that, you know, it was the only door to opportunity for them. We do know it changes. We know that people make that decision. They consciously choose the way they use their language. And just look at accents in the United States. We used to have a lot more regional accents than I think you would find anybody argue today. Ask anybody on the street. They think that American English is being standardized. I think it's the same for global English. And I think there's a reason for it. People want development. They want access to markets. And the easiest way to do that is to speak the common tongue. So that, that's really the tensions between global and local. Do people speak the English as their second or third or fourth language more represent the more global culture or actually the people who speak only English? Who is more global? I mean, in the old standard, I remember is that like in, in North America is that if you speak only English, then you, you represent the global, the standard. What's in Europe? English is just one of the many languages. In fact, speak multiple languages is the standard. So multilingual. And, and 
nowadays we not only have kids who are bilingual but multilingual so they kind of jump back and forth and then it seems like as you mentioned uh dialects it seems like uh, if they more and more it also if it, it's the same with the expression i noticed the uh, z generation they no longer know the uh slangs anymore like play hooky like when you say that you kind of outdated you know what is that you know Oh, that's a snow job, right? Like all this like little, but, but the young, younger one, they no longer use those phrases. And that, I have a question. Then, do we, when we understand globalization, do we understand as more like Americanization? Even the, the idea of Anglosphere, I mean, the Anglosphere, it, it's like Canada, Australia, and, uh, Britain, and the United States. And New Zealand, right? But it's more like uh, America, in a way. But then when we say America, then we need to look at it. It doesn't really mean the Midwest. When you say Americanization, which part of America? Is it more like New York, California, rather than the Midwest, right? Or Texas? I mean, we even say, let's assume that if the United States represents the global modernity, then how about Texas or Florida? Or the diversities within the United States or UTA. Like when we think about global, uh, we think about New York, you know, we think about San Francisco, but not necessarily UTA. Yeah, sure. Um, I think people, I, for me, I just feel like it's something people do perhaps to gain some sort of um, rhetorical value more than define themselves, right? To say I'm part of the global West, it gives me some sort of cultural capital that I wouldn't have if I were, you know, from a different group with certain people, right? And so they may not say, hey, I'm from the West. So I, you know, I'm like Texas, you could get a New Zealander who says they're from the West and they're nothing like an American in a lot of ways, but they would still say that in certain situations perhaps. And I think that's more of a rhetorical value than sort of a, a, a an identity value. And, and perhaps those are pretty well connected. It de really depends on the context. And, you know, I, I, I feel like going back to your comments on language, right, we can't really control this. It, people decide for themselves every day, and that's what makes the system evolve. Yeah, I mean, again, to language, right, let's take London as an example. You have people who speak global English and also people who speak Cockney. I mean, Cockney, uh, is it like, so again, we see the tensions between global and local. So which, which London is... The, the West. And you, we can see so many global capitals uh, in London, but then you can see many local cultures in London as well. And it seems like it's a, a fusion of many, many things. So it's very hard to really pin down what is the West and what it is not. It, so it sounds like we've talked for a while now. We don't know what the West is. We don't know when the West is. We don't know who the West is. We know it's changing, but we don't know how, why, and for whom. So we, we, we actually haven't answered very many of our questions, but only come up with more questions. Yeah, I think it's uh, just an introduction. I think in order to really understand this concept deeply, maybe we need to dig to some concrete examples and focus on a specific region or country. Maybe we can talk about uh, the United Kingdom, and then France, Germany, uh, the United States, uh, and, and Canada, and slowly we move to Asia. We, we can move to Asia later, and then talk about Japan, uh, China, South Korea, so on and so forth. And maybe we can talk about Russia. Then we can really unpack this idea, this multiple modernities, multiple West, <laughs> in the quotation mark. In sum, I want to say, like, the so-called East or the West, they are kind of mutually influence each other. So culture travel, it's not just one way direction, one way traffic. It goes multiple way. I mean, it depends which uh, time period. Sometimes in you know, the East culture travel to the West, then it travels back and back and forth. It's always like that. 